few minutes. I know we we'll always have some people straggling in, but we'll give it just two or three minutes before we jump into the talk. But thank you all for coming. Um, if you haven't used Zoom before, we do ask that you use the chat. Um, it's really great to see where everybody's coming from. So even if you want to just say where you're tuning in from, um, it's always kind of, these have been great because we've been able to see people kind of come in from all over the country. And I think we've even had some international people on some of these. So it's kind of been really great to see that and have people join from places that we usually can't have people in on these. So you want to do that. Any questions you have um, throughout the talk, just put in the chat and at the end of their presentation, we'll go through and kind of touch on all of those. Um, we do ask that you keep your microphone silenced, at least through the talk. Generally afterwards, some people take their mics off and if they want to ask questions that way, you're more than welcome to do that as well. But we do ask that you wait to the very end of the talk. So you're also more than welcome to turn your video on. It is really great to see faces. We already have some people with them on. Um, if you notice it's kind of skippy or kind of slow, it sometimes helps to have that off. But as I said, it's really kind of nice to be able to see people throughout the talks um, as this is a time where everybody has been locked in their house, not seeing people for too long. So, so we'll give it just another minute and then we'll kind of get things going. Hope too many people didn't get mixed up with the change of time. This is our first Thursday that we've done this on. We have been running these Friday nights, so I feel like that's probably going to cause some confusion. There'll be someone that's trying to sign on tomorrow night for the talks. I know I've gotten my Zoom meetings confused before, so. All right. We are going to just jump right in and kind of get things rolling. Um, so if you did just join us, I think there's one or two people that got on since I did made the announcement, but please keep your microphone silenced throughout the talk just so we don't hear the background noise or anything else going on. Um, if you have questions or you think of questions throughout, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, as we go through, probably towards the end, we'll, I'll kind of field all the questions to Kyle and Kelly. Um, and as I said, if you really want to hang out after, I feel like a lot of people turn their mics off and kind of talk after the everything's kind of done and over. You're more than welcome to do that for a few minutes. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here. This is, I think, our fifth or sixth Artist Happy Hour series, and they've been really wonderful. It's been really great to have everybody join in these. Um, I always say this is like one of the blessings of the pandemic is actually getting these things going. It seems like a lot of places throughout the country have started these things, which I can't believe no one has been doing this beforehand because it is really great to be able to like sit in on artist talks that generally you're not able to see unless you're in where they are actually giving the talk. So. Um, thanks for supporting these and coming out and being a part of what we've got going on. Um, so today we have Kyle and Kelly Phelps on here, which I know I am super excited to have them on there. They make really amazing figurative work and I have been big fans of theirs for quite some time. Um, I'm not going to sit here and introduce them too much because they're on the call. I'll let them kind of do a quick introduction of themselves and and then we'll kind of get things moving. Well, I have uh, Kelly Phelps. I'm a professor at Xavier University, and I'm a figurative artist. I am Kyle Phelps. I'm a professor at University of Dayton. And just to start off, I'd like to say that we're very, very honored and yeah. humbled and blessed, you know, that, that you had taken us on and, uh, you know, let us share our work with you guys. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to start these out like I have kind of everything else and just see kind of like, I know before this started, we were talking a little bit about how 
COVID and this whole pandemic has affected not only your studio practice, but everything else you have going on being both professors that has really had a huge new impact on your day-to-day -day life. So if you want to tell us a little bit about kind of what you've been doing since this happened and kind of how it's affected your life. It's funny because Kyle and I were in, um, we were in kind of full swing up until about March, February actually was our last exhibition and then COVID hit and then it's like, oh my God, now we have to put down our, put away our, our artistic hat and now we have to get in like survivor mold and, and start hoarding toilet paper and going to Kroger's and, you know, you know, cause you just forget that you're an artist and now you're in full swing of survival and, and now that things are kind of calmed down a little bit, now we have a chance to kind of kind of organize our time between hoarding toilet paper and, and going to Kroger's and now making work again. Because that first, of, I think that first solid month of COVID really kind of scared the, the, the bejeebus out of a lot of people. And it was like, art really isn't you know, gonna happen anymore. So yeah, it's been, it's been a challenge, but now that we're kind of getting back into a swing of the routine, and it was a big adjustment because we're coming from an academic side where you're used to doing the hands-on and have to switch in the midst of things to going to completely online. Man, that threw a wrench in in everybody's you know schedule and their work ethic and and everything with it. it just it's a big change, but it's it's also been a blessing to actually to have time to actually you know spend time with your family and you know reorganize your studio and and the like. So yeah. Yeah, I know the beginning of this. I feel like everybody, I don't know, I, every, I had this big idea that everybody's going to make you in their work and make a ton of work, but it was so hard, especially that first month, as you said, kind of to actually get in the studio. There was so much happening. Kind of the great unknown made it really hard to work. Yeah. And I'm glad that I'm not the only one that feels that way. I'm sure almost everybody has kind of had that overwhelming, but it seems like things are sadly enough getting kind of normal now and you're kind of getting used to the routine of how life is going but um i know you guys have quite a presentation to jump into so i want to just get you rolling on that and let you guys talk about your work and your process all righty well i'm gonna go and get on the screen and get this going so yeah right here can everyone see this so far Perfect. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna switch gears and now Kelly's gonna kind of take over the talk so that we're not like two arguing, bickering brothers. So I will go ahead and do the presentation and Kyle will kind of field the questions. So um, we'll get right into this. Uh -oh. Uh oh, what's going on here? One second. I'm having a little glitch here. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without there being at least one problem. <laughs> so. Okay. So, desktop mode. Great. We get right here and it freezes up. Okay. All righty. Um, so, we were kind of talking earlier about having the world's smallest studio. So it's funny because this picture was taken um, oh, about four or five years ago. We had a, a chance to be featured in American Craft Magazine. So we're thinking, oh, wow, fantastic. They're going to come visit our studio. And when they get here, it was like as the needle scratched across the record, like, this is your studio? So literally, you're looking at from the outside of the house, looking inside the studio, they literally had to take the window sash out and film from the outside of the studio. So it just goes to show that you can make work any place, anywhere. You don't have to fa have fancy facilities or big infrastructure to, to have art studio. Art studio is just for production. So yeah, we kind of laugh at times because we do put out a crap load of work, but the space is really small. Um, our, our beginnings are, it's kind of funny because people kind of laugh at like, oh, we're identical twins and it's a gimmick, but our, our upbringing kind of started early on because our parents literally dressed us the same. So literally we are, we are kind of programmed into this, 
kind of sharing of everything. So clothes, um, artistic abilities, everything from cars to just just everything. So we are literally like having, um, we're literally one person in two separate bodies right into adulthood. I mean, we share our same taste into our automobiles, our careers are identical. Um, we're both um, full professors and, and we've done sabbaticals together. So it is a complete lifestyle. Right down to our children. So Kyle's got a little girl and I have a little girl. So, so right into our inspiration and our early works, um, we we're really influenced by the WPA. Um, to put this in perspective, our, our parents worked at Chrysler and Chrysler and our town was kind of like growing up in a miners camp where everything was controlled and owned by by the factory. So literally the high school was named after after the factory. So our first real experience of art was when our my mother went to a garage sale and bought home these National Geographics and one of the publications had a a big spread about Dega Rivera and boom, it just blew us away because our work really connected to our family. So this was our first experience of looking at art and seeing depictions of figures and people who look like us and our people, not just African-American people, but working class people. So this became a big influence for Kyle and I. So um, every so often we get to go back to Detroit to see the mural and, and man, it's like, it's like Mecca for us to go home and see, see the, our, our biggest influence, our point of influence is these, these murals. And they're huge. But also the fact that we are really based in religious kind of iconography and, and, and imagery. So we're, we we're really inspired by some of the religious art that was going on, especially when Kyle and I were forced to go to church and, and we had to pay attention to what was going on, but we, our minds would always drift to the art that was inside, inside the church. So we really kind of paid attention to those relief sculptures and those paintings and the, the, steel, the stained glass and just the whole notion of narrative and storytelling. So that was to kind of give you a little context to our, our influences and how we kind of, kind of stayed with that religious kind of theme as well as our working class theme. Um, we were really interested in those invisible people as subjects for our artwork. So we started to look around our neighborhood and, and see those factory workers and you know to hear that factory bell and understand what that shift change meant to us we were really, really interested in trying to kind of recreate that whole notion of the working class hero, but you know, the same thing that Diego Rivera was doing in his mural work. So a lot of our imagery will have vocabulary that stems from, from the factories, such the, like the factories or, or found objects and parts and pieces and remnants from factories that have been torn down or, or leveled. So a lot of the imagery you see here is actual research imagery that we've gone all across the Rust Belt collecting um, photographs and, and found objects from the site. And what we do is we take those objects and we juxtapose those with handcrafted ceramic forms. Travis, can you guys hear us okay? Perfect. Awesome. So I'm gonna go through these a little bit. So this is a, the last factory that my father and I worked in and my brother and you know, a lot of my family members worked in was Borg Warner Gear. And literally the factory is over a mile long. So if you can imagine like taking the Empire State Building and putting it on its side, huge mega structures, completely empty. This is some of the imagery from the inside. So what Kyle and I are really passionate about is capturing this kind of once was, you know, what was kind of the heydays of the factory. Um, if a factory like Chrysler or Firestone moved into your town, man, that factory provided for everyone, right down to the barber shop who cut the factory worker's hair, to the shoe cobbler down the road that repaired the, the factory worker's boots. 
So when the factory closed down and they started to level these structures, they would leave huge concrete scabs of where these factories used to be. And you could see them, you know, from outer space. Just that was kind of the sore spot for Kyle and I, and it literally our entire community, because it was what provided for that community. So Kyle and I would actually go through it before we'd even touch a lump of clay or, or, or weld anything or anything, we'd actually go through and start to archive and record all of these sites. So to give you an idea how big these structures are, Borg Warner Gear was 1.2 million square feet. That is a huge space. And imagine seven of these lined up. I mean, some of these factories were bigger than the communities that they exist in. So our work is about that. We want to capture those, uh, capture those artifacts and those, those found objects and juxtapose those with our figures to create a narrative. So this work is um, literally studies of found objects juxtaposed with ceramic forms. So the actual uh, lunchbox and the thermos are two scale life size and then render down to smaller found objects. So I'm gonna throw, like run through a couple of these real quick. So when Kyle and I started through our undergraduate, we were really interested in the figure on our first early experiences, we were making kind of like the angry black man art because, you know, we're African Americans. We have to make and know something about our, our rich background, which true, it is rich, but it wasn't our shared experiences. Kyle and I were dealing with work about the civil rights era and slavery and, and the middle passage and all those things that were important, but yet really did not have a direct impact on Kyle and I, like the working class know that our parents lived up to. So I'm gonna give you some examples of just the just the figures. So it's funny because when Kyle and I were in graduate school we had our first major breakthrough and had a um, a big critique in the Leo which is like an arts magazine and the critic wrote about our work and she said that the figures were were fantastic, much like Hummel figurines. And it was like, wow, that was like the needle across the record for us because, you know, we were thought we were big shit at the time, but we were compared to Hummel figurines. Two giant black guys making small Hummel figurines. So it taught us a lesson that we needed to have not only the figure, but an element to support the figure and vice versa. So we had to create some context for the figure to exist in. And that brought us into having these found objects that came from specific factories that told the rest of the story, that helped narrate the story. Such as this piece is called Boots of the Proletariat. And the actual facade is actually scrap metal that came from downed factories that, that were no longer in existence right down to the factory boots. Uh, those factory boots were my father's boots and the for sale sign was the sign outside of the chain link fence when the factory was shut down. So we literally appropriated all those objects and juxtaposed the handcrafted ceramic form with the actual facade. Uh -oh. Here we go. So literally we start out with the figure and then we actually start to formulate our compositions by adding those found objects such as those work boots. And the actual background, let me go back, is actually a skid. So those cast off common things you see at factories, those great big pallets. So we actually took the metal and clattered right on top of the pallet to create these kind of low kind of shallow relief sculptures. So common elements that you'll see throughout our work is gonna be like corrugated sheet metal. That's something that you see with every factory because typically the roofs were made out of corrugated sheet metal. Um, cast off metal. Um, I don't know how many times we've been almost nearly arrested by the local sheriff or constable will come by and think that we're scrapping for copper or aluminum or 
some other semi-precious types of metals that were left on the site, but we'd actually be interested in an actual scrappy, rusty, scorched metal that was presented there. So every factory's got a factory bar. So we wanted to kind of talk about those things that existed. When the factory fell, the last institution to die is the factory bar. So literally the actual background material, the drywall is actually scrap materials from the level bar that existed. This is a John Henry series. And once again, same thing when the railroad industry started to fall apart, you know, the, the also occupations that were held proud by many African Americans started to fall with it. So our modernized John Henry became a part of that series. Our whole notion of um, the factory and our, our kind of religious influence kind of popped into it in a way that we talked about the church as being the institution that was really important for our family, but it wasn't the church as like the idealized version of church kind of equates to religion, but, but we're talking about the church taking on the role as the factory itself, the actual factory facade being the structure. You know, because my mom and dad went to work religiously. Those gears that you see on the left and the right are the same gears that they produced for over 25 years. So it became important to understand that this place was where the factory workers actually went. So these structures became really important for us to create and help narrate the story. It's another John Henry series. Once again, we do a whole lot of repurposing of materials. So what you're looking at is actually a crate that actually held those railroad stakes and we repurposed and refashioned and kind of re redesigned that crate into this kind of low relief altar. This is actually at the Asheville Museum in North Carolina. Before Kelly and I got into the whole, the whole notion of ceramics, we start off as painters. And I know this whole blasphemy kind of thing about putting acrylic or oil paint on ceramics, you know, it worked for us and it's not to replace glaze. Um, we just, I think I would just kind of believe in taking from the greater toolbox of art, you know, instead of just relying on just one thing and you could, you could use acrylic or you can use oils or you could use glaze, you know, we just use what felt the best for, for our work. And we still try to inject as many found objects as we can, right down to scrap nails that we found from the site. So the actual buttons that make up the form of his, his bev overalls were actually nail heads, nails that we actually embed into the clay body we fire right in and they make up, they make the perfect damn buttons. So we're gonna, shoot through this so we can get through some. So a lot of the work looks pretty deep, but the reality is they, they, they make up a really shallow space, typically no smaller than four inches, no larger than eight inches deep. So they look really dimensional, but the, re the reality is that they, they're really shallow. On all of our forms that we make, all of the figure elements, um, the figures are completely made solid solid clay and then we haul out the inside or the back side of it. So what you're seeing from the back part of his soul back part of his shoulder, the inside of his cavity, his thighs, his his legs, anywhere it's really thick will be hollowed out. And we're going to show you that process later on. Formally we learned the figure when we uh, did our undergraduate and our graduate studies and we worked the figure in around and then we pit it up against the wall and like wow this is really counterproductive. There's no way that you can do the figure quickly and still have that illusion that the figure is completely in the round. So really high relief work really excites us uh, because it creates that illusion that you can get with, you know, with a completely figure in the round. We started to look at narratives um, and why uh, things were important to factory workers like the factory break, uh, the smoke breaks that existed, just everyday scenes that you would see um, that, that countered 
countered what was going on in Diego Rivera's imagery. So with Diego Rivera's Detroit mural industry photos, uh, paintings, they were all in, in production. They were all in movement. They were, they were, they were working. Um, our issue is that Kyle and I were at the tail end of a big event that happened during our time um, working in the factories. And that was when NAFTA came into the factories during the, the late 1990s and literally cut the factories in half. So in other words, the factories gave a notification to its workers, hey, we're gonna take half of you guys and we're gonna, we're gonna send the other half to Mexico. And that eliminated thousands of jobs and literally killed off lots of factories. Because the likelihood of you moving to Mexico you know, just to keep your job was next to zero. So, and the major corporations knew that because they could hire cheaper labor in Mexico. So a lot of the figures um, that make up the work are in wait. The workers are in pause, they're, they're, they're not working, they're idle, you know? So that's something that we wanted them to, to show throughout a lot of our body of our work. So once again, juxtaposing a found object, such as that welder's torch, Kyle and I had the opportunity to go into a, a Buick plant and find, retrieve objects, whether it be a, a boot or a lunchbox or an old glove or some welder tips. I mean, all these become part of that narrative that we're trying to create. And once again, this is an example of utilizing painting skills and we try to really instill that in our students, with our students that, yes, it's okay to, to be proficient in one part of craft, but to be proficient on lots of, you know, different types of craft, whether it be drawing or printmaking or painting, bring all those tools together and just make art and get past the silo. So um, another example of taking found objects and juxtaposing with those figures. Oh, um, so the figure looks completely in the round and it's literally 180 degrees um, and completely hollowed out. So it's really super light, but it does the job of making that illusion that it's completely in the round. And once again, utilizing everything from decal work to hand painting, um, we try to use as many um, tools in a toolbox to create the art and not really call it one thing or the other. The other interesting fact is that we utilize um, a lot of found objects such as scrap metal and metal shavings, and we embed that right into the clay body. And what happens over time that exposed iron or scrap metal permeates through the clay body and it creates rust tears. Our rust actually starts to bleed through, bleed through the clay. because when it hits the atmosphere, it starts to oxidize. So the forms will have a crusty, rusty kind of a element to it rather than really polished and smooth. I think throughout all of our work, all of the surfaces of all of our clay figures will have that, that, that kind of roughed out surface treatment. You know, there, there are people that really polish um, the surface, but we have no bones about, you have no bones about leaving our forms really roughed out, kind of like a, kind of like in progress or like a gesture, you know, that's something that's really attractive to us. So it's something that you'll see throughout all of our work. It's funny because um, whether you like him or hate him, I mean, Michael Moore has some, some of our work, but this is a, a, a Buick plant that we visited outside of Flint, Michigan. And we got these big metal pans that, that pieces you know, ran through on the assembly line. And then we created the narrative, the pieces called Us and Them. So this is one of the pieces that Michael Moore has in his collection. So this brings us into another body of work that we um, were really interested in because we were always interested in things like the middle, the middle passage and civil rights and things like that. But because of our age, we weren't really directly impacted. So Kyle and I started to think about, wow, what is our civil rights moment? What is our, I think we're in one right now. But it wasn't until Obama was deemed president and his eight year term and the moment afterwards, like, oh, kind of hit us, like now what? So this is, a, this is called After the Dream and it talks about 
it talks about labor and it talks about racism and the American dream. So we wanted to kind of capture all that into one composition where we talk about all these issues and how, what it means to us right now. So this American conflict thing uh, series would always have this, this whole backdrop of the American flag so we could talk about other issues, social issues like poverty or how we treat our veterans or, you know, any number of things that we could talk about, but we always use that American flag as the kind of the beginning piece of our conversation. Uh, right down to immigration, um, how we treat those other invisible people. You know, every, we were just talking about Nsika, how we go to Nsika to the conference and we go to the hotel and I don't even think twice about, well, who made my bed up or who gave me fresh linen or towels and these people perform their task and they, they just disappear. So we wanted to kind of depict kind of not just the blue collar working class struggle, but that invisible struggle, struggle that takes on with agricultural workers and people who are in the service industry who do these everyday tasks and they just disappear. So once again, we're talking about the, the, the border and immigration issues and making kind of um, commentary about the wall, you know, because once again, that is a modern thing for us to deal with as far as this model, modern day civil rights and rights of just human beings. So we had the commission at Lorraine Motel in Memphis, um, when was it, two years ago? Two summers ago, um, to do a piece about the moment in time before or right after the assassination of Martin Luther King and that famous water, uh, water cooler, water fountain photograph that people have seen depicting whites and blacks, you know, water fountains are being separated. So this brings us into kind of the modern day kind of era of civil rights and what's going on right now, which is really fitting because Kyle and I started this series about 10 years ago. Uh, the death of uh, Philandro Castile. Um, I mean, you turn on the news, you see it every day, so. Right down to George Floyd. So these images became our modern day civil rights kind of issues that we talk about. So we talk about things like, um, the over militarization of uh, the police uh, departments, uh, the Black Lives Matter moment, uh, movement, um, police brutality, there, any number of things that we were talking about that you see on the news today, we bring it back into kind of a modern day setting. We always go back to using that flag as a way of bringing, you know, bring our, our narratives together. I mean, one of the, the biggest symbols is, is our American flag. And, you know, these are all problems that are happening within, you know, the United States. So we also, um, we talk about the issue of black on black crime and how it doesn't really get notoriety in the news and police violence, as well as, uh, you know, gun crime and, and things like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about our process um, and about our studio. Um, it's funny because we have done this so often and, and it took us a while to think about our work ethic and where did it come from and how did this begin. It wasn't until we actually worked in the factories and understood what a work ethic actually meant um, and that whole notion of production um, we had a chance to work with our, fac uh, our father in the factory and we learned how to make four or five pieces all at the same time. Um, we wouldn't have that experience had not we had the opportunity to work on an assembly line. So we had that assembly line kind of um, mentality of, of kicking out lots of pieces so we don't get bored 
so often we're working side by side or back to back and just constantly moving our work. So there's no one authorship. It's not a Kelly piece. It's not a Kyle piece. It's, it's our work. And that comes with a lot of compromise and a lot of arguing and bickering and fighting. I mean, sometimes um, we're so close to each other. It's like, well, you saw us earlier. I mean, we're, we're nearly shoulder to shoulder. So it's like, God, why are you sweating? I can hear you breathing. Are you doing that on purpose? Get off of me. That kind of stuff. So it was like, and believe me, those are not just, those are sanitized words, but we're normally bickering and arguing. And, but at the end of the day, we understand that it's for the betterment of the piece and the work itself. And like Kyle said, we're, we don't have a singular authorship. It's a Kelly and Kyle piece. And that's it. So our studio, once again, like Kyle said, we, we do work either left to right or right to left, back to back, side by side, but it's never, Kyle has his own piece and it's his own little pressure pe precious piece and I have my own little precious piece. We really work together really as a, as, as a machine. But if you look at the back, you see two large kind of upright structures. That's our relief board and they're slightly canted back a little less than 90 degrees um, so that the work kind of our, our figures actually kind of lean against the board. So you can see um, the one to my right, the, the darkest piece is the wettest work and the one at the Kyle's end on the left hand side is kind of relatively drier. So we kind of work from wet to dry. So we know what we're doing. So once again, um, a lot of people say, well, wow, how long does it take to make a piece of work? It, 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 it's, it doesn't take that long. I mean, because you know, we have 20 fingers and four hands. So it is a, it is a production. We, we go relatively quickly. You have to have that subconscious okay to free yourself up to, you know, having your brother or your partner or whoever, you know, make changes and you have to be okay with that to move on. So this is the piece that we started out. We always start our process with a, a sketch or an imagery, or we do video stills. Uh, we do, you know, audio uh, recordings. We do a lot of background research before we even touch the clay. Once we get that initial sketch in our mind, then we go directly into clay and we start to work the clay. Kyle and I deem it as kind of having like X clay vision. You can see that image and that lump of clay. Um, so we work solid and then we go through the process of fine tuning. And then we figure out what our hollow points are gonna be. And we start to kind of figure out where we're gonna hollow forms out. This is uh, from the underside of the work and you can see those holes actually are worth clay has been excavated out. Once the form is hard enough to su support its own weight, then we go back into fine tuning and really doing some extreme detail. Like coring out of the head. So if you notice the head is there, had we not cored out the head, hollowed out the head, that would have been a ticking time bomb, like a grenade. So we hollow out everything that we possibly can and we conceal the dig outs. We conceal where we actually got rid of the clay. This is always the best part of the day is like Christmas time. Boom, this square, hooray. It survived. It survived. <laughs> So now we actually can go in and we can start to prime. And then we start to do the surfacing of the work. So normally everyone has their own ways of going, to, going about surfacing. And, you know, like I said, we start off as painters. So we use a lot of acrylics, oils, and, you know, stains. But it's something like we've always started off with with a black covering first. And then once we have the, the, the form surface, we construct or fabricate the background. So this is some really quick uh, sketches, gestures of some of the, the work you saw earlier in clay. Right. And then you can see like, wow, I really like that bolt. So I, I I'll literally leave that in the clay and I'll fire that bolt directly into the form. Now, there's a trick to that. All you have to worry about is when things start to shrink, you have to have enough room for your forms to shrink around. Otherwise, you'll have things to crack or crack off. So once again, that's going back to having those found objects be a part of the form. 
there's a good uh, picture of the lean-to boards and how we um, have space between the form and, and the actual backdrop. So going back to this, we like to have that illusion of shadow and space. So they don't look like hieroglyphics. There's actually space behind the forms. So we do that in a way that we can actually hide all of the dig outs. So the forms are completely hollow. Here's three works at one time. the piece that we saw earlier. So average size is about 22, 28 inches tall for our pieces. I think one of the reasons why we work the wall is now we can compete with photography and painting and printmaking. You know, we've been told that, you know, people have more wall space than they do have freestanding space, but it's something that has worked for us and something that we just continued on. So this is a transmission um, uh, skid. So a transmission would actually be on those two figure cells. And then the center trays would actually be the gears that fit inside the transmission. So we took that and then that becomes that piece there. So we actually juxtapose all those found objects and that sheet metal to create. A lot of our people think art starts at Dick Blick or Utrecht or Home Depot or Michaels. Well, no, art starts at the source. So it's better to be authentic than to try to kind of prefab something that really doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the, your materials that you're working with. So we always try to be true to our materials. That oil can, the gear, they all came from the site. So fire in process, once again, I really like those little bolts. And those little uh, brass, brass fittings or wire fittings, and I'll fire those right into the form. Uh, once again, the moment that we unload the kiln, um, unfortunately we couldn't see that area because it's pretty um, full of crates and stuff right now for our exhibition. But once again, we'll, we'll, we'll do a whole production of work and then we'll biscuit all at one time and then we'll start a whole new process. So that means cleaning up the studio top to bottom, getting all the clay dust out. Since we're in a small space, got to protect our health, got to protect, you know, try to make sure that things are clean. Okay, uh, real quick. So the bisque square, you can actually see with the fire ends is what we call all those dark spots, those little buttons. Those are all, once again, found objects, those nails, those bolts, those screws, and we'll fire them right into the form. They turn a little crispy and they actually turn colors, but So once again, we formulated the figure and now we're actually fitting the figure with the backdrop. This is a decal work. <laughs> Back in the day, Kyle and I used to hand paint every little American flag, every, like screw that, get a printer. Like, evolved, so, <laughs> so now we actually, uh, we just print. And now you could really make some really interesting, neat little scale, two scale details. Uh, this is a production where we go from priming to the left to actually uh, surfacing and doing underpainting for flesh on the right. Um, we do everything from traditional hand painting to airbrush. Uh, acrylics where it's needed and oil paints. And wow, I was worried about not getting through it. That's it. How do we get back? Uh, awesome. Up share. Sorry for going a little too quick, maybe. No, that was great. I love seeing your guys' work. As I said, I am, I've been a big fan of your guys' work for too long since I got involved in ceramics and definitely like his figurative people. I am thrilled to kind of see your work. I think there's such like, there's so much emotion in your work. Um, you know, and I really, I, the part that sticks out to me is kind of like when you, you made the switch from making the factory work and then kind of jumping into kind of, I guess it's like the current event kind of work going on. I loved how you really like said, like you in grad, or grad school, you guys were kind of working with some of those issues, but it didn't feel authentic to you because you hadn't lived through it. And I really, I mean, I make like narrative work too. And I really think there is something that really comes through with your work when you're being true to like 
where you're coming from. And I think it's, I mean, it's lovely to kind of see how your work has developed into kind of like the more current status of everything from the factory thing. Um, we did have a question about the, like your factory experience. Um, so it really was such a big part of your work. How long did you guys work in the factory? Um, and really what made you take the jump? I mean, it seems like such a switch going from working in a factory to being an artist is like a whole different mentality of life, essentially. So, so keep in mind, we lived in a really unique kind of um, environment and had a really unique experience that if your dad worked at Chrysler, you were most likely going to work at Chrysler. And Kyle and I were the last of that generation to be a part of that experience because my dad worked at Chrysler. Uh, we had a chance to work in the plant, um, Borg Warner with him. Um, but we grew up in a factory blue collar town. So art, ceramics, that wasn't on anybody's <laughs> radar. <laughs> Unless it was um, holiday art where you drew that weird turkey with your hand. That was the only kind of experience that art we, we would actually have. So. I think we've always had the appreciation of the arts going in through high school, um, but it wasn't until getting into college and, you know, our, our parents were really supportive. They didn't really quite get the whole art thing, but they're kind of very, they're still very supportive of it. And then Kelly and I had a little stint from working in the factories um, just for summer help. And, you know, our dad Sucked. saw the writing on the wall that the factories are not going to be there to support us. You know, those days are almost long gone and we needed an out. So we went on to grad school. We met Bobby Scroggins um, at University of Kentucky and he was our first mentor. real mentor that, you know, there's this guy doing exactly what we want to do for the rest of our lives, you know. And he looks like us. Yeah, so it was kind of important to, to us to go through and, and, you know, do what we're doing today to this day and, and still love it. So we really, really appreciate it. But we, it, it just, created another thing for us is that, you know, profound respect for working class people because we are literally the makers of everything from the toilet you sat on this morning to the shirt you have on your back. That is from a designer or an artist. So for me, it's really encouraging to be a visual artist because, you know, we are the innovators. We are the makers of everything, whether it be practical or more aesthetic, we are the creators of it. So I think art, you know, artists are in a good place because there, there's opportunities. I think we, we have a true respect because workers in general are so underappreciated, put it that way, and you don't really see them represented in, in the arts. So it's just something that it's stayed with us for forever. Our dad, you know, he, when he was living, he always wanted us to do something else. You know, well, why are you making factory work? You know, why don't you do um, Tiger Woods swinging his golf club? Or I saw this cool deer on Nova because that was the show that he watched. I'm like, yeah, Dad, we're gonna get right on that deer. <laughs> we're gonna do that Michael Jordan. Like, I could care less about Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods or yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I personally think there's like people come. My dad worked in the factory. I'm from a family of like no one's an artist either. Um, but they all made things and I don't think people generally realize like what goes in like every almost everybody makes something in some kind of way and I think that's you know working in the factory is that my dad was a machinist that's what I grew up doing you would ask me like I'm not an artist but yet he's yes. yeah. always making things with your hands and I think that is kind of what happens in that environment there really is something that transfers into I mean, clay, I mean, you took probably your first clay class, you're like, oh, wow, yeah. like this is the material and kind of how it works and creating something, but then like bringing your own stories into it is like, that's why we all do it. It's so great. I mean, um, you say clay is the cheapest form of magic. It's just the yeah, <laughs> clay is the best and worst material possible to work in. <laughs> That's kind of how I see it. So uh, we do have, uh, what is the flag and all the backgrounds made out of? Um, it's made out of the flag. It's, it's, it's the real flags. Um, at first we started painting flags and like, well, once again, we're trying to get the drive in that whole notion of being authentic. So everybody's still tied to the flag. Um, and, and, and the whole notion of being patriotic, but there's this undirty underlining issue about that whole notion of the American dream and what it means to each person. 
Um, so when we start thinking about the flag, we have to think about what does it mean to be an American today and how are we struggling to meet that American dream? And it, it's, it's tough because a lot of people look at it like, oh, you're being anti-patriotic by having or disrespecting the flag or, you know, because we paint on it, you know, it's just a backdrop that, that everybody knows what it is that we use to draw in to, to talk about our narratives of, you know, things that are, are tough topics, you know, but like I said, not everyone gets it right away or some people automatically jump on the bandwagon like, you know, we're disrespecting and, and we're, we're really not. All we're doing is just telling a truth that's out there, you know, that they, we are living in a lot of struggle, you know, and, it, and it's something that we just need to find our way. If, if we're this great nation, then we got to live up to it as well. Yeah, I love the stories that you really do. It's like just the way you tell about what it is to be an American. There's so much of that in your work. And with that being a flag, I really, as a ceramics, I'm a total ceramics nerd when it comes to like materials and everything. I feel the opposite. I know nothing about paint, so paint terrifies me. Um, but I really love how you're able to like use ceramics and kind of blend it really well with the other materials. I often times find it really, it's really kind of like a lot of times you see people try to mix clay with other materials and then it looks kind of off. And I think the way you guys do it, it works together so well and really kind of adds to the whole piece. And it doesn't, you know, it flows together really well and it doesn't blow like, oh, that is not, you know, sometimes it feels like things don't belong. And I really love how be able to blend it together really well. Um, and the amount of details you sculpt in those little things, like the little water bottles, all of the details on the clothing is. Well, it, it's funny because um, a lot of the found objects that come that help narrate our stories, our work has not, it's been a collaborative between Kyle and I, but now it's a collaborative between Kyle and I and the community. Because you, I can't tell you how many lunch boxes, the old school metal lunch box with the thermos that sits inside, I've got boxes of those and boxes of those stinky work boots that people will say, hey, can you use this? This is my grandfather's. Our wives hate it. Our wives hate it a lot. <laughs> yeah, because it's like um, we, you become a, a junk harborer. You're, you're like um, a hoarder. A hoarder, because now you got all this stuff that, that we feel responsible. Now, now I have to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah, there's got to be some pressure behind people giving you stuff to put in their work. You know, yeah. I think it goes back to this whole sense of being authentic. You know, if they look at this lunchbox and say, hey, this reminds me of, you know, their father, their grandfather, you know, can you use it? It's kind of like passing that on. And it, it's it's been pretty useful for us, but we're getting a lot of it, though. So. Yeah, and it starts to talk about those understories, too. Like our father worked in the factory and the year that he retired, they replaced his position with a machine from Korea that works 23 hours out of the day with one hour setup. So it's like, I'm not against automation and, and, and moving forward with technology, but those things happen so often that the American hand of the, you know, of, of, of the worker gets replaced by with technology and becomes a second thought. I mean, you know, that job no longer exists. Definitely. Um, we did get a real good question. Um, just, we have someone that would like you to elaborate a little bit on kind of why you always pick to choose people kind of in their breaks and kind of in between the working and there's not a lot of people actually working. Well, it's, um, especially now, because now it's a kind of, you see it in real time. You get a lot of people, I just talked to my sister who works in a factory in Indianapolis and there literally isn't enough work for some of the factories, workers right now, because a lot of people are waiting on parts from another factory. So they will they will kind of a milk a job for three days just so they're they're in they're still in their position for one. So a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that people are waiting for a comeback. I know I don't want to get political with Trump and all that. Like the coal miners are waiting for coal to come back knowing that coal is not going to come back. The very factories that, that came and went in our hometown, other factories have come into their space and they're not even, not even a third of the size of what it used to be. So it's just like technology and, and, and automation has come in and replaced a lot of 
lot of jobs. So you've got a whole vast you know, swath of people who have to either retrain. What 57 year old man is going to retrain and learn computers and compete against the average 19 year old for the same job and take, you know, two thirds less pay. I mean, that, that's the dilemma that we're in right now. So a lot of our workers, a lot of our images will have those workers that are just kind of waiting. We actually got to physically see this. I mean, you know, when the factory started to shut down, a lot of machines were either idled or you have these guys who have certain skills and we can't use them. You can't use them anymore. I mean, I mean, that to me brings up like the way you're talking like how do you both feel about like this technology used in the arts with like 3D printing and, cool. and, and all of that stuff. I mean, how does how do you guys like really think about the that? Of the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, we we have I think technology like 3D printing they all have their place, but I think that if we understand it as a tool and leave it as a tool but not a replacement of. I mean, we made the argument with painting and photography. When photography came out, oh, this is going to kill painting. Well, no, it just made painting different. So I think that we're in a spot now where if schools are not careful, they go for the sexy, because 3D printing is pretty sexy, and laser engraving is pretty cool, and, and injected ceramics is cool, but it should not ever replace craft. It should not ever replace the craft. I think manual dexterity, using your hands is utmost important. I think if it's used, technology is used as just a tool, then I'm all right with it. But just as a sheer replacement, not a chance. Yeah. I don't think it's going to replace it by any means. I just wanted to kind of hear you guys as <laughs> part of what's happening in the craft fields right now. Um, do you have any other influences besides Diego Rivera that you guys are really into? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think art goes beyond just visual arts. I mean, there's music. I mean, music is so informative. I mean, man, it's the soundtrack of everything that we do is music. So whether it be bluegrass or punk rock music or Motown, I think music is the biggest inspiration. Um, I think that um, people in the community go out and, and you know, we, we talk to people and, and the, you know, they give us a lot of feedback and, and, and give us a lot of inspiration as far as, you know, because we kind of have been doing this like for over 20 years and, and we're still stuck on it. And I don't think I'll ever be finished with talking about those workers because, you know, we were so close to it. I mean, we were so close that we could actually hear the factory bell the change shift changes behind our house behind right? our house i mean i mean and now to think about it now today how weird that was to hear a factory whistle that that's that's strange i mean it's just um all those things become an influence and, and inspiration and and it all informs our work it's not just looking at other artists it's 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 those other people in the community and hearing their voices and and understanding who we were it, it, that's what really drives and motivates our work yeah, I know for me personally, like I remember being in grad school. I mean, you talked about kind of trying to, you were forcing your work in grad school. I remember I felt really like a lot of pressure, like art has to be this thing about this grand topic. And you always kind of try to look away from your life at first. Sure. It always comes back into your like, what do you know? And that's really like how it should be. But I think there's always like this, I don't know, again, I don't come from an art family like I didn't grow up going to museums so you think you you always think of art as like this thing where it's got such deep meaning and how you try to put it into it and then when you really just look at your own life and like kind of the things that were kind of mundane to you and kind of how other people really relate to that and I think you, the work you make is really relatable to a lot of people and it really is a lot about the, the American dream and the experience of being an American and I think I'll, you know that's your work touches a lot of people in that way so i think we got a lot of criticism in the past because like you know what people expect us to do you know we've had a lot of um exhibitions where you know people say well this is not afro centric enough it's not black enough you know but we're talking about a community where it was working middle class working poor white black female male whatever we're all working for that one purpose that one cause 
living in that same kind of neighborhood. So it wasn't a black white thing for us. And we always hated that notion of, oh, you're not a black artist. Like, well, what, the, what is a black artist? Like, we still, we still kind of toil with that to this day. Like, wow, we're really popular in February, Black History Month, but other than that, yeah, it's hard. Um, Do you get more of that now with like the current climate of how things are going? You get people who have good intentions and good meaning, but they don't understand that to be an artist in the shortest month of the year, <laughs> once a year is pretty pathetic when your counterparts have 11 months and you get one month. I mean, that's... That, or you're recognized only for that month. And so, then you have to be the spokesperson for the entire black race. Like, dude, I grew up in Indiana in a small white farming <laughs> town. I don't know the entire black experience. I know my experience. So you get a lot of that. There's well intentions and there's misinformed intentions, but you know, it's just hard being an artist, period. So I think that's why our work kind of transcends white or black when dealing with, you know, the work that we produce, like a working class work. And we do things that are social political that deal directly to with race. With race. You know, it's either a lived experience or, you know, something as, you know, I don't even know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, in general, we need more perspectives from more Black artists in the community, which I think is finally really starting to happen, which is really great. And I think everybody's experience is different, and everybody should share their own experience and rather than trying. I think it's really funny to say that people have tried to push, like, you trying to have to encompass the whole, what it's like to be a Black person in the United States, like, that's unrealistic. It's kind yeah. of hard for anyone to think push that on you, which is awful, I think. And I, again, I love that you just shared your experiences, and I think that's what art should be. So hearing it from more people is the important thing rather than trying to have one per person encompass the whole experience for everybody. It's absurd to me, but uh, who knows what people, the things people see to artists sometimes blows me away. Um, sure. We do have a couple technical questions. Um, what kind of cone do you fire to? So typically, since we're not, we're not eating out of these figurative, you know, forms that we're creating, we just go typically just to, to bisque, you know, 04, 05. There's nothing, there's no reason for us to push it any, any higher than that. And then so, that, that increases our production because when we go that far, I mean, when we go to kind of mid-range cone firing, we're able to get works out. The works can dry quicker. I mean, we don't have any special sculptural body recipe that I can give you. I mean, we use a lot of standard clay, but I mean, I don't use any different kind of grog, you know, because, you know, we let our work stand up and we air dry it and we fire it. That's it. I mean, there's no trick or rhyme or reason. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people, especially sculptors, will have their special clay body and their special grog and they know the exact grog count, like, nah, that, that's too much time to think about that. It's production moments for us. You know, we go back to our surface treatments where we have no bones about leaving our forms. It's almost like a finished gesture drawing, put it that way, okay. really roughed out. So the hand of the artist is always very present in our work. So we don't, we don't really get in. And this is just how we work. We're not polishing a marble here, all right? No. So all of our work, fits with our with our content over narratives. I mean, we're not talking about things are dainty and, you know, super nice and happy all the time. So us working rough, it just kind of, I think it complements, you know, the topics that we're covering. So do you would you all consider yourself like a ceramic artist, just artist period? That's I feel like that's a weird thing as I think that we consider us as if, artists. How do you identify as an artist? Like, I, I say I'm a ceramic artist. That's mainly because that's what I use. Sure. Like, you know, there's the, always been the art versus craft movement. So, yeah. you, as soon as we start saying, as soon as we stop saying ceramic artists, now we're going to mix out of every <laughs> ceramic opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I would say your work falls more into the art category. There's very, you know, it's maybe half ceramic. So it's like interesting, like how do you, I don't know, there's always. I think that we just accepted that we just like to make work. You know, it happens to be, you know, maybe a, a certain percentage of it is clay, but like our figure in there, figure elements. And then our facades, you know, they're found objects. So I don't really know how to even classify us as being um, 
a ceramist, but I don't really. And then who, ma who makes these ridiculous rules? I, yeah. I never yeah. understood that. Like, yeah, I don't think there is rules. I've been asked by people before, like, how do you identify as an artist? You know, it's like a, it's like a weird thing, especially in the craft world. I think it's more of a thing yeah. using a traditional craft medium and, you know. And I can say how many times we've had like, like just big blowout. You know, everything has to be glazed, 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 glazed. You could have did that with mason stains and you could have oh, China glazes I, and, you know, all the other stuff that you do. It. <laughs> we just, we just use what we use. We don't, we don't try to, you know, categorize, you know, who we are and what we, what we do. We just try to make the, make work. Yeah. yeah I don't think you need to. So that's the perfect answer for that question. Um, do you guys have studios at your university or do you just work out of the one space that you have? No, I mean, we typically, it's fine because you know, this is a white suburban neighborhood. So oftentimes when we get off work from school, then we can end up in our studio between 11 o'clock and 2.30 in the morning. We might be the only glowing light in the neighborhood. So I think his neighbors probably think we have some sort of meth lab or something going on <laughs> because, you know, we're always in full production mode, but it's always at, you know, because we have families. I got, I got a little girl and I got a wife and he's got a little girl and a wife and but we typically um, do our work here. Yeah, I mean, I think I just found it more convenient to leave the academic setting, come home, and you, you have the opportunity to, to bust out some work here. So we're very blessed to actually have a space that Kelly only lives six minutes away from me, and you know, he come over anytime and you know, do what we need to do to get the work going. And we're very blessed. I mean, Kelly could be in Alaska and I could be here. So when we first started out, we both taught at University of Dayton together and then went our separate ways for yeah. Savior. Yeah, definitely. I'm jealous that you guys have such a good working relationship. Phil, who's on this call, actually me and him have done some collaborative pieces. Like it's, it's really fun to do those things and you guys kind of work really, I mean, you've got it down. You know, there's something about working with- You got the, you got the sanitized version today because <laughs> yeah. normally there's a lot of cussing and- I'm sure there's the spouse between it. As artists, we're all stubbornness, all hell. You know? So it's kind of, and it's... It's like a marriage. I mean, it is, um, he's my partner and I'm his partner. And, and we, we have been doing this for so long that it's just... Um, it's kind of second nature. Second nature. We don't yeah. think anything about it. I mean, it's just part of the process. Yeah, and as you said, you said in the beginning, it just makes the work stronger, kind of kind of as artists it's pretty hard to let down your bars sometime and kind of let I mean as me like I work by myself I mean my wife yells at me all the time and I'm like what's wrong with it she tells me what's wrong and I get defensive immediately <laughs> you know just because it's like no that's not what I'm after uh but in reality like she's just trying to help me and she's telling me what's wrong um so I think there is something about opening up and being able to have that good working relationship with someone that really probably does make the work that much stronger. Um, it's funny because outsiders look at us like, why aren't you a bouncer or are you a bodyguard or you know, everything but an artist? Like you're we're too big to be <laughs> working like, that small. We're wrestlers. I got every kind of depiction except being a visual artist. Like, don't you work at the club? Don't you, aren't you a bouncer over here? Like, no, I'm a sculptor. Like, then they look at you like you're crazy. Like, what? <laughs> uh, I've had some really weird comments to me about being like, where I worked at a studio where people came through all the time. Someone walked into my space and me like immediately just like, oh, they were like so let down that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like, oh, I, I thought whoever made this work was going to be way hipper than you. <laughs> I was like, like, I didn't even know how to respond to something. Like that. People, like, again, it's like that looking back on, like, what, I mean, I didn't know what an artist was when I was younger, you know, like, I thought, yeah, you have to fit into this certain mold, and it's, yeah. oh, it's ridiculous that I even had those ideas in my head, but um, I think a lot of people still have that, you know, like, they think artists are, like, these zany, like, we, like, Andy Warhol-ish figures, which, most people are like pretty normal, you know? It's just a really funny thing that I think just gets pushed off on artists in a really weird way. Um, I'm gonna end with, we got a few more questions, so I'm gonna roll through these really quick. Um, we have one about, do you ever have any problem with the acrylic paint or anything kind of peeling off over time or kind of not sticking? 
Uh, we only use acrylic in certain areas like clothing because acrylic is great for like matte surfaces, but then we use uh, oil paints for flesh for flesh because of the luster and the way oil paint penetrates. So we kind of pick and choose and designate when we, when we use acrylic because we don't typically use acrylic for flesh tones, things like that. We do a lot of uh, oil paints and underpainting and things like that for the flesh. We usually, when using a, a acrylic, we use we usually dilute it down so much so it actually permeates through the clay body itself. So you don't have that tendency of um, drying and peeling. Yeah, and then having so. that kind of plastic layer set on the surface. So we do a lot of kind of, it's like Kyle said, it's really diluted down and we start building up like an underpainting. Nice. Um, have you ever used beeswax or any of that stuff on your work? Have not, but I saw a lot of artists that, that use that video. and really wonderful. Another thing that, you know, somewhere down the line that we'd like to experiment with to have that kind of I wouldn't say it's like translucent but kind of kind of yeah so I use beeswax on my work so uh -oh. I, it's my favorite material ever my work looks like crap until I get beeswax on it so <laughs> it's I'm all for it we just had a question of you because I know a lot of like even paintings and stuff sometimes people will put on it for that kind of like satiny, you say a non translucent, but you kind of a nice sheen on it. And your work really does have like a really nice surface quality to it. Um, whether it's the mix of the different paints you're using, I don't know, you know, like I said, paint blows me away, it kind of scares me because I don't understand it, which sounds ridiculous, but I've never, I've never really painted. I don't come from a painting background. I started out very traditional, we used glazes and then we like had eyeballs that actually like fell to the cheeks and their mouth would end up on their neck and because you know with glaze you kind of have to really know that yeah. that chemistry side of it so you know yeah so how things will flux and stuff so like how we start as painters why can't we just paint yeah. and it's like boom it worked and so we'll end with kind of the one how so you both have young daughters how are you introducing them into art or kind of getting them involved in making anything well <laughs> <laughs> so I have a six-year-old, and she's just now getting into um, into clay. You know, start off with some play-doh, that kind of stuff. But she's the attention span is not quite there for me yet. Yeah. And my wife has to keep reminding me, like, um, get out of teacher mode and you know, be fun. more into the daddy mode and let her have fun with it. It's like, what? Why is that eyeball up here? <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> so. Yeah, they're, they're experimenting, mostly more 2D stuff than anything else. And then we're kind of not pushing us on them. So, letting and them letting them person. kind of experiment with multiple different things right now. So, yeah, with my little girl, I mean, one day she wants to be a unicorn, and the next day it's ballerina, and the next day it's frozen. And <laughs> you just have to let her be who she wants to be. And today happens to be she thinks she's a unicorn. So, um, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I'm sure they love coming down and seeing your spaces. I mean, I feel like they have to love that. So, and kind of being around art, I've got nieces and they love kind of just seeing what I'm working on. So it totally changes having a child, you know, where you could be selfish, even when you're married and single, that you have time to, to do your thing. But now you got to split that even more down and mm -hmm. take care of the kid and kids, the top priority. And, you know, and then you really have to find time to, to get in. And it does change your work a little bit. You know, you just have to work it in whenever you can. You know, but we're we're very blessed and you know to, to have you know two little rugrats right now. So yeah. Well I definitely want to say thank you guys for sharing this. I the you know thank you of your work. It was really great to hear the stories behind the work, see a little bit of the process and really get to know you guys a little bit better. So thank you for coming out. Um, I think everybody else seemed to really enjoy this hawk as well. Um, thanks everybody for coming and being a part of these. Um, next week we are actually taking one week off just because it's holiday week. Um, but following that we have a couple good people lined up in the future. So let me pull up and I will tell you the dates and everything. So on July 9th, same time, 7 o'clock, we've got Maya Aleppo who is a metalsmith working out of Pittsburgh. And then the following week, July 16th, we have Travis Townsend, who's kind of a mixed media artist, works with a lot of wood, um, makes some pretty cool things. Um, that should be a good one. And then on July 23rd, we have Marlene True, who is another metalsmith working out of Eddington, North Carolina, who is the director of Cosin Center for Arts. Um, so there's some good stuff coming up. I definitely recommend tuning into those. And... 
thank you all for coming. It's great to see everybody's faces. And again, huge round of applause for Kyle and Kelly for coming out and being a part of this. Thanks, Travis. Thank you, folks. Thank you. I really appreciate everything. Okay. And everybody have a good night. As I said, if you want to hang out for a second, you're more than welcome. So that was great. Thank you. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. We do.